So now I can do something. God is bringing me people. You know why? Two reasons. I ask for it every day. I live for it. I live for it. I live to help other people. You want to get out of your depression? Help somebody. Stop stockpiling. It's not doing anything for you. All your stockpile, besides giving you a false sense of security, is it really making you happy? The answer is no. Might make you feel like a little like, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing good. Let me check my finance. Ooh, okay. Feel good? You feel closer to God? You're missing the boat. The Israel trip. Obviously, people are panic stricken. What else is new? Don't pull out. First of all, you're going to lose money. If the war continues, they're going to refund all your money. They have to. It's law. EO doesn't want anybody to get hurt. Don't panic. Everybody that's watching that's signed up, stay signed up. And if it ends up we can't go, then we can't go. Okay? Please. We got a lot of calls. EO's getting calls. What's going to be? Breathe, man. How are you going to handle the tribulation? Oh, you still don't believe in that? Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Maybe we'll go over that next week. <laughs> um, the news called us right away and wanted to do an interview right when this thing happened. Monday, you know, they wanted to come right over. And, man, they came, and the young man was really nice. As soon as he got out of the car, I said to him, I said, you're a believer. He said, how do you know? I said, I smell, I smell the Lord on people. I smelled it on you. And he was really devout and really beautiful. And he asked me a lot of questions. And I gave him a lot of answers. And they didn't put any of them on the news. <laughs> because obviously they went back to the program director and said, well, that's religious. That might offend this one and that might offend that one. So I guess the truth isn't important. It was so disappointing, I'm telling you. If I could have ever socked anybody in my tenure as a rabbi, it would have been that day. And the program director lives in my neighborhood. Yeah, when he puts out his garbage can next week, he better put it out and run back to the house quick. <laughs> if you hear something you like today, you can clap. It's a participatory. You can say amen. If you hear something you don't like today, just be quiet. Um, it's very hard to talk about history and prophecy and all that goes on in, you know, 40 minutes. It's just not, you know, you're going to get a snippet. I've been thinking about these things for 34 years. Um, but I really think you should look into them. Even, even like I say, you know, your theory about the rapture. How, how did you develop a theory without studying all the scriptures pertaining to the rapture? You just heard somebody say something and you just went with it? That's, man, I never told my kids that. That's not the way we taught ours. It's insanity. Yeah, but people have been saying that since 1850. I know. Hitler said if you tell a big enough lie for a long enough period of time, it becomes the truth. Look at this track record. So first and foremost, we'll put up, like, probably the most important scriptures for today. You're very familiar with these scriptures. It's the Abrahamic covenant. Guys, I've said it a million times. There's five theocratic covenants in the Bible. Five. Not 105. There's just five. You should know which five those are. I'm not going to test you. But man, you're a Christian, you're a Messianic Jew, whatever you call yourself, a believer. you got five theocratic covenants. Five. Five. And the first one is the most important. This is numero uno. And the reason why is because you can't fulfill a covenant that you don't make. So the new covenant, the fifth covenant in Jeremiah 31 is most essential, okay? That's the fulfillment, but this is an amazing turning events for the human kingdom. This is the period that God formally and publicly announced he was gonna save the world. Now he didn't make this decision in Genesis 12, that decision was made before the foundation of the earth. Nevertheless, this is huge. It says, now, Adonai, for those of you who are new or just visiting or 
by the looks of some of your faces, I could tell you were dragged here. Sorry. I may never see you again. Hopefully you're born again, so I'll see you at the big party. If not, oh well. Now Adonai said to Abram, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, away from your father's house. I wonder how many of us, if we heard this, would go. Pretty tired into that place, huh? Yeah, ten pegs, not a concrete slab. Ten pegs. Get away from your kinsmen. Away from your father's house and go to the land that I will show you. I didn't want to come to Macon. <laughs> I love you, but I didn't want to come here. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. It's an individual blessing. Obviously, Abram's a big deal, right? Three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, he's the father of all three. He's a big deal. I will make your name great, and you ought to be a blessing. So he's blessed to do what? Yeah. You're not a terminal. Stop being a terminal of blessing. You're a channel. Let those living waters flow. It's not a pond of blessing. It's rivers. And I'm not talking the Akmolgi. I'm talking, you know, the Colorado River. The Snake River, you know, class five rapids. That's what should be flowing out of you, man. Light. The American church is the bushel basket. She's now the bushel basket that the light hides under. We hide our light in here. And then we sometimes turn on our light at our small groups and our women's Bible study, right? The light goes on. Then we leave, turn off the light. Don't, don't turn. Don't do it. Religion and politics don't do it. Politics? I can give a crap. People are going to know about my father. It'd be a sad state of affairs if my kids, like if I was, they didn't know I was home, and they would talk to a friend, and they're like, yeah, my father is kind of, man, that would break my heart. They're proud of their dad, and I fall short of the glory on a regular basis. I will bless those who bless you. Guys, I don't know if you've looked around, but there was only one country, really. You know, maybe two, but only one real country for a long period of time that was blessed. Every other empire fell apart because every other empire cursed Israel. America was blessed because she blessed Israel. She wasn't founded by the Puritans. People take it back to the 15th. She was founded by the separatists. These were people in England that were fighting the Church of England, and they came to America. They worshipped on Saturday. They, they celebrated the feast. They weren't weirdos. Who was in there? They just separated themselves from it all. And America always blessed Israel because out of 8 million square miles of Arab territory, she's the only democracy. So they did it politically. Some believers love Israel because the Bible says to. Man, it'd be a sad state of affairs if Bernadette loved me because the Bible says she should. I know you're watching. If that's the case, see ya. You're free. It's a sad state of affairs if you love Israel. And Israel, why do you love a country? Israel is synonymous with the Jewish people. When we say Israel, we say Hebrew. It's the people. God's about people, not places. You think God like goes, wow, I did really well, but man, the Amalfi Coast, that's something. Which it is, but that's beside the point. He's about people. Souls, people. God so loved the world. It's not a place, it's people. And America is not in the place she was in, not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. And anyone who curses you, I w like God's saying, they curse you, they curse me. Look, God is very tight with Israel. Israel is his wife. 
So let me give you a little scenario. Let's say a couple of you, maybe, maybe one, maybe, all right, two. Let's say two people in this place really love me, legitimately love me, right? And then I find out you're walking by the road and Bernadette was being accosted, and you just walk by. You feel me? And then you come to me, Shabbat, and you go, Rabbi, I love you. And I go, man, I heard when Bernadette was being accosted, you just walked by. You didn't, well, I, we didn't really want to get involved. Nothing against Bernadette. We just want to remain neutral. You're not going to be in my good graces. I'm just telling you that right now. See, some people might even say this is judgment. First of all, who the heck do you think you are that you understand anything to be able to spew that? Why are you that guy? Horatio Spafford lost five daughters. His stupid church said it's judgment. It was not judgment. Why do you go to that? Why do you go there right away? And let me explain something to you. There was plenty of times when I was young that I saw guys beating on a girl and me and my friends made sure that stopped. Now, if it was a husband and wife and they were getting into it, don't meddle. It's not your business. That, you can get hurt doing that. Israel is God's wife. Mind your business. If he wants a chastiser, that's his business. If you want a chastiser, you're going you're gonna to have a problem. You, do you understand what I'm saying? You know me by now. I, I, I don't speak religiously. This is real. Does Israel need to repent? And so does everybody in this sanctuary. Don't forget where you came from, and don't forget where you still go every now and then. And then this is, this is the crescendo. And by you, who's you? Abraham and his offspring. Who's his offspring? Who's the nation? There's an individual blessing, a national blessing, and a an universal blessing. There's three blessings. God's very Trinitarian. His number is three. That represents divine perfection. He's saying, Abraham, you're going to be blessed. True. Abraham, you're going to birth a nation. True. And Abraham, through that nation, I'm going to save the world. True? You sure? You're not convincing. Look at the next slide. Huh. You people... You people, try that today, you little softies, you little cupcakes. So dang soft, it's pathetic. Bernadette and I raised our kids to not, not hide from the wolves, to attack the wolves. You people don't know what you're worshiping. It's very fitting sometimes. The Samaritans were half Jew. They had their own form of worship. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim, not Mount Sinai, not Mount Zion. They had their own priesthood. They even substituted some of the feasts. They were doing their own thing. Sound familiar? You could love Jesus very much and still be doing some of your own thing. He said, we worship. Woo! What's the we business? Who's talking? Jesus. And who's the we? He didn't say I. We. Who's the we? The Jewish people, he and them, are we? They're one? Stop saying, I know Jesus was Jewish. He didn't convert. Unless you know something I don't know. Maybe during the ascension, some Methodist pastor in the second heavens threw some water on him. <laughs> we, the Jewish people, he, we, us, worship what we do know. We worship according to the Torah. Because salvation comes from the Jews. Guys, it, it, seriously? If he is a Jew and salvation is of the Jews and you're saved, how can you not be crazy about these people? 
How did that happen? Come on, Rabbi, give me a break. For 40 years I was in church, nobody ever mentioned anything. Your Bible mentioned something. Salvation is of the Jews, and that's why Israel matters. That's why. God's goal is that none should perish and all come to everlasting life, and he used Israel to accomplish that. And he is using Israel to continue to accomplish that. And that's why Israel matters. And Israel matters to God. And if you love God, they should matter to you. Now, I'm probably the most unpushiest messianic rabbi in the MJAA. I don't tell you to wear talits. I don't push the Jewish card at all. I don't. Because I'm not caught up in my identity. My identity is in Yeshua, not in Judaism. From the first day I met him, I could have gave up everything for him. Still would. But nevertheless, the truth is the truth. It's just a fact, right? Once God declared that the nation of Israel was to bring forth the Messiah of the world, a target was put on their back. Satan aggressively started to develop strategies to take her out. Israel had paid a tremendous price over the centuries for her calling, as well as for her own disobedience at times. People sometimes that are closest to God will pay dearly for their disobedience because they have the most light, they have the most responsibility. Too much is given. However, through the gifts of repentance and God's great mercy, he has always brought her back to his good graces. Although at times she has forgotten the God of her salvation, the God of her salvation has never forgotten her. Why? Because Israel matters. It was the Lord himself who prophesied in the 14th century B.C., 14th century B.C., that Israel would forsake him, that Israel would suffer, and that Israel would go into exile. Look at Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 4. He said, when the time arrives that all these things have come upon you, all these things, the chapters just preceding, is the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. By the way, they're still in operation. Both the blessing and the curse, which I have presented to you, like I just said, you are there among the nations. Yep. You're going to be exiled. He kicked Canaanites because they were detest detestable. Detest throwing their kids to the fire. Bestiality. Disgusting. Lewd. Sexual acts. Greedy. Murderous. He didn't just dispel a people and go, you know what, I don't like you, I like them. Who... What do you re read Leviticus? Why? Listen, we live in a world today, i got to tell you, it's so frustrating because I'm 65. You used to have to be an expert to speak. Now any moron could voice themselves on social media. And some of you morons listen to those other morons and spew it back. you got college kids that don't know nothing about nothing, nothing about Israeli politics. And they're saying, well, I think, you think, I'm sorry. Who are you? Well, I'm entitled to my opinion. Sure you are. But look at how ignorant. The things you're saying are historically not true. Did you ever look into it before you spoke? Two sentences on, like, TikTok? Really? Those are your expertise? Oh, Rabbi, check out this tweet. Shut up. <laughs> really, don't make a fool out of yourself. I'm going to exile you among the nations to which Adonai has driven you. Adonai, not the devil. God's in control of everything. Make no mistake. Don't give the devil that much credit. Uh-uh. He was kicked out of God's abode. That fight lasted a split second. And now from the book of Job, all we know is if he wants to try to get access to God, he's got to cower and beg.
At last you will stop thinking about what has happened to you. And you will return to Adonai your God. Isn't that nice? He's prophesying that they'll come back. Why? Through repentance. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that makes us repent. Rabbi, you can't make us repent. Oh, you'd be surprised what God can make you do. Don't give yourself that much credit. He permits free will. He permits. You'd be surprised. You, Noah, what choice did he have? Either die by gastric juices or do what God told him. God will sometimes put you between a rock and a hard place and you think you have a choice, you don't have much of a choice. God waits until the disaster of our choice has taught us the foolishness of that choice. But still God waits and longs to be gracious to us. Wow. Wow. We don't do that with other people. Wow. Wow. It says in Isaiah, I'm just, I just opened up the Bible, so I wanted to show you this verse. It says, Adonai is just waiting to show you favor. He's dying to show you favor. In fact, he died to show you favor. He will have pity on you from on high. For Adonai is a God of justice. Happy are all who wait for him. You will come back and pay attention to what he said, which will be exactly what I'm ordering you to do today. You're just going to come back and do what I told you to do in the first place. And why did I tell you to do that? Because you'll be blessed. And I love you. And I want you to be blessed. I love people that go, if I did it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing because it made me exactly who I am today. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Seriously? Go, go do yoga. Go, go. You kidding me? I know for a fact some of you sitting here right now would have thought about sec about marrying the person you're with right now. Oh, Rabbi, no, I didn't make a bad choice. Well, maybe the third time you didn't. But what about the first two? Yikes. I hope I get out of here in one piece. <laughs> Let's go to the continue this slide in Deuteronomy 30, okay? Go to the next slide, please. At that point, I don't know your God will reverse your exile, show you mercy. Wow, he's prophesying this then. they got to be freaking out. It's like, you're telling us we're going to be disobedient, we're going to be cast to the nations, and then you're going to bring us back? This is unbelievable. This is a crazy prophecy. He will return and gather you from all the peoples to which I don't know your God has scattered you. If one of yours was scattered to wherever you go, I will find you. That's the God of Israel. And I'll prove it to you in a little bit. I don't know your God will gather you even from there. He will go there personally and get you. Wow. Wow. Guys, if you read this stuff like I read it with feeling and I put myself in it, it's always wow. But if you read it fundamentally and then you just recant it like a parent and go, Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 4. If it, oh, man. That's insanity. Sanity. The Jewish people were completely exiled from Israel or killed after the Bar Kokhba revolt. That was 135 AD. Millions were killed and millions were exiled. Done. Not a Jew left. It was in that same year, just for your edification, that the Romans, Hadrian, changed the name of Israel. He changed the name of Israel. This is a fact, guys. This is history. From Provincia Judea, to Provincia Palestina, or in English, Palestine. Do you know that you won't find the word Palestine in the Hebrew Bible? Do you know you won't find the word Palestine in the Christian Bible? Do you know you won't find the word Palestine in the Quran? Rabbi, where did it come from? I, I thought I just told you. So they changed the name to Palestine, but make no mistake, God never changed the name of Israel. He changed the name of Canaan to Israel. You could fight me over it. You can get political. Look, today, you're not looking at a Jew from New York. You're not hearing from a Messianic rabbi. I told the news, my perspective is a biblical perspective. 
My worldview is biblical. So asking me a question, what do you think? I'll never answer you that question. It doesn't matter what I think. I'm going to give you chapter, verse, and history. And that's what I'm giving you today. It's, it's not about geopolitics or the land. Stop giving your philosophies or what you heard. Operate in truth. Just cold, hard truth. Just deal with it. Look at Jeremiah 30, 18, please. One of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Thus says Adonai, I will return Jacob, another word for Israel, his captives to their tents. I will take pity on his dwellings. Cities will be rebuilt on their own tells, their mounds, with palaces where they're supposed to be, Zion. No one knew when these prophecies were going to come to pass, guys. No one. Not Jeremiah, not no one. They didn't know if it was going to come to pass in a week, in a year. But for 2,000 years, 2,000 years, the nation of Israel lay dormant. No land, no Jews, no government, no priesthood, no sign of national life. But Israel matters. No nation in the world has ever survived two exiles. When they came back, they were all speaking Hebrew. How did they preserve the language for 2,000 years? What I'm talking to you about is all supernatural. It's all miraculous. If you try to understand this in the natural, you're going to frustrate your brain. Smoke is going to start coming out of your ears. Look at Isaiah 66, 8. The question is ridiculous. Who's ever heard of such a thing, Isaiah says. This is the end of his prophecy. Who has ever seen such things? Rhetorical, no one. No one's ever heard of such a thing. No one's ever seen such. Is a country born in a day? Ridiculous. A big, emphatic, fat, no. You don't birth a country in a day. Are you out of your mind, Isaiah? Is a nation brought forth all at once? No. But as soon as Zion went into labor, the prophecy about the rebirth of Israel is over the top. It's ridiculous, but the unthinkable happens because God is God and Israel matters. So on May 14th, 1948, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the Union Jack, which was over Israel, was lowered in Jerusalem. David Ben-Gurion, the primary national founder of the state of Israel, said, and I quote, the land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here they wrote and gave the Bible to the world. By the way, that's Romans 3.1. If you don't like them for Jesus, I, you should like them for preserving the word of God. The state of Israel will be open to the immigration of Jews from all countries of their dispersion. When he made this announcement, you've got to understand, everything is spiritual, sweet pea. This is not a war between Hamas, which means violence in Hebrew, and the Jews. It's a war between God and Satan. You have to take everything back to that. Everything is spiritual. If you're having a problem with somebody, you're offended. It's either because you're easily offended or they're offensive. Either way, at that point, you have two options because Satan does not have a social security number. You either let love cover a multitude of sins or you approach that person. People don't approach because they're non-confrontational human beings. So they think they're doing number one where they're really not doing number two. And the problem is they hold a grudge. And then they start not liking the person. And they don't want to like to see the person. And then you got weird things going on in congregations. Because all these broken little links from stupidity. And you quench the spirit. The devil went into a tailspin with that announcement. Muhammad's a replacement theologian. Islam is replacement theology. They say that God gave his covenants to the Jewish people, but through unrighteousness they lost it. Then God gave it to the Christian people, but through unrighteousness they lost it. So he gave it to us. 632 AD. And he said the Jews are no more. Even she's replaced by the church. The church says that. The church spews supersessionism. 
Do I hate the church? No. My best friend is watching. He was the head of the Southern Baptist Convention. I love him. He's my brother. But truth is truth. Replacement theology has been preached for hundreds of years. So when all of a sudden David Ben-Gurion said, we're back, it made Muhammad look like a liar. He was a liar. At that point, so they went into a tailspin. And Satan goes, oh, oh, this is incredible. A nation's born. How did this happen? I just put him through the Holocaust. I put him through the Holocaust. I killed 6 million. I killed 1.5 million children under 10. I decimated them. How are they back? This is not possible. And he freaks out. And he has to do something. He has to react. So to save face, just hours after David Ben-Gurion makes the announcement, all he said was, we're a nation again. And hey, Jews that aren't here, come home. You want to come home? Come home. That's all he said. He, didn't, he wasn't imperialistic. Guys, America is imperialistic. The UK was imperialistic. Rome was imperialistic. Israel, she's anti-imperialistic. She just gives up land. Which isn't smart, but that's a whole other story. So just hours after he makes this announcement, post-Holocaust, these feeble people, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, the Arab League of Nations, join forces and attack pitiful post-Holocaust Israel. The Jewish sector of Jerusalem was in a state of emergency, and they were under total siege. Food supplies were slim. The people were existing. Listen, in a week, this is what their diet consisted of. Two ounces of margarine and a quarter pound of dried meat. Try that. Quarter pound. Four ounces for the week. And two ounces of margarine. Azam Pasha, the secretary of the Arab League, said, and I quote, this will be a war of extermination. Haj Amin al-Hussein, who was the spiritual leader of the Muslim, spiritual Muslims, because they have spiritual leaders and they have prime ministers. Prime ministers are puppets. Spiritual leaders call the shots. He said, quote, I declare a holy war, my Muslim brothers. Murder the Jews. Murder them all. Let me show you a slide. And you'll see why our military, like uh, West Point and the Naval Academy, they don't study Israel's wars because they don't make any sense. You study wars to glean some strategy, military strategy. There's no strategy to glean. So the Arab nations had 40 tanks with guns. Israel had one broken tank. They had 200 armored cars. Israel, this is 1948, by the way, had two. Warplane 74, which is incredible. 74 warplanes. It's a nation of just a few people. <laughs> no warplanes. Artillery projectiles, 145. It's ridiculous, guys. Israel is against all odds. She is totally outgunned, totally outmanned. But God, March 10th, 1949, nine months, three weeks, and two days after the war began, the Jews had a miraculous victory. You know why? Israel matters. She might not matter to you, but she matters to your God more than you know. Hopefully by the time you leave here, you might know a little bit more. And all the prophecies about the return of the Jewish people, hundreds of prophecies that you read all the time to their homeland come to pass. Let me just give you th the big three. There's hundreds, really, but there's no point. We don't have the time, and you'll get sick and tired of hearing me if you're not already sick and tired of it. I understand. Don't worry about it. This is what I do for the Lord. It doesn't matter to me. All I want to hear at the end of the day from my father is thumbs up and I'm good to go. Jeremiah 16, 14 through 15. 
Therefore, says Adonai, the day will come when the people will no longer swear as Adonai lives who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So he's clarifying up front. I'm not prophesying about the Exodus. Okay, there's something different. But as Adonai lives who brought the people of Israel out of the land to the north. Land to the north. And out of all the countries where he drove them. For country, he didn't drive them yet, Jeremiah. How do you know this? He's a prophet. He, would, he didn't even know what he was saying. It's not important. The messenger isn't important. I'm not the issue. You can malign me, you can hate me, but truth is truth. Deal with the truth. For I will bring them back to their own land which I gave to their ancestors. Jeremiah is prophesying worldwide aliyah. He's saying they're going to be scattered all over the world. They're coming back. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the nations, the goyim, all the nations, and gather you from the countries and return you to your own soil. This verse describes Israel's regeneration and Isaiah 43, 5, 6. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Now you can claim this because you are grafted into Israel. According to Romans 11, you're part of the commonwealth. But don't take it out of context. We're going to give you the interpretation. You can take the application. But you must understand the interpretation before you apply it. You can't just grab scriptures and, and, and put it on you. You can't just put them on a t-shirt and go, don't touch God's anointed. I'm a pastor. Nope. Psalm 105 is talking about Israel. Sorry, pastor. I will bring your descendants from the east. I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. Exclamation point. I'm not yelling. I'm just giving you grandma. And to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. What? When Isaiah prophesied this, there were no Jews in the west or the north or the south. They were all in Israel. Do you understand? Stop me if you don't. There were no Jews anywhere but Israel when he prophesied this. He's talking about a future event. The east, there was Arabian Jewish immigration. The west, there was European Jewish immigration. The north, there was Russian Jewish immigration. And the south, there was African Jewish immigration. Israel's right in the center of the world. Exodus 19.4, you got to see this. This is so magnificent. I could preach till Yeshua comes back on this one, but we'll make it short. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. You ever wonder why he uses the eagle? The eagle is an incredible animal. Ancient Hebrew culture, which we're going back 2,700 years, revered eagles as mighty warriors. See, eagles never turn their back to a storm. Never. The, the, the more the storm intensifies, the higher they fly. Their sight, their flight, and their fight is incredible. They only have one enemy, and that's the serpent. And they will grab the serpent, mess with it, and fly at breakneck speeds to a rock. And as soon as they see the cliff, they turn and snap their talons, and they smash the snake's head into the rock. They care for their young. Eagles are the only birds that carry their eaglets to safety away from predators. Other birds carry their young in their talons, but eagles carry their youngs upon their wings. So the only way you can hurt the young ones, if you shoot through the old one. God's saying, I'm the old one. I carried you on my wings. If they want to get to you, they got to get through me. Eagle's wings are always an expression in the Bible of the wonderful tenderness of God towards his children, Israel. Isaiah 68. Who are these flying along like clouds, like doves to their dove coats? Isaiah says that plain loads, plain loads of Israel's sons and daughters would return someday. When? We didn't know. But all of a sudden... As soon as Israel became a nation in 1949, God said, you guys are coming home. How is that going to happen? Watch. 1949, the first Aliyah is called Operation Eagle's Wings. Make sense? They airlift 49,000 Yemenite Jews, Jews in Yemen, 
the Yemen Arab community was totally anti-Semitic. They placed such heavy restrictions on the Jews in their community, according to Islamic teaching. The Jews, all they could do was clean the sewers, carry the dung out. Yemen was so primitive then, in 1949, they had no appliances, no tools, no vehicles, no electricity. The people of Yemen had never seen an airplane. But when the airplanes landed, the Jews came running out and said, Eagle's wings, Eagle's wings. 1950 to 52, Operation Ezra, 150,000 Iraqi Jews. There was 150,000 Iraqi Jews. You know how many Jews are in Iraq today? Zip. They were airlifted to Israel. When they saw the planes, they cried eagle's wings. From 1960 to 1970, the former Soviet Union only allowed 4,000 Russian Jews the right to return. Russia was adamant and told the world 4,000 and no more. Take it or leave it. The United States couldn't intervene because they were in the middle of the Cold War. But that didn't stop God from intervening. Look at Jeremiah 23, 7, 8. Therefore says, I don't know, the day will come when people no longer swears. I don't know, lives who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But as I don't know, lives who brought the descendants of the house of Israel up from the land of the north. What's directly due north of Israel? Russia. And from all the countries where I drove them, they will live in their own land. In 1989, the Iron Curtain became a shower curtain overnight. Bernadette and I were in Berlin. We were at Checkpoint Charlie's when the wall was coming down. Nobody, nobody predicted it. Nobody understands. In the history of Germany, Eastern Bloc Germany and Russia, they don't understand how it happened. I know how it happened. God said, 4,000? I don't think so. They're coming home. So a record 71,000 Jews were airlifted that day. And since 1990, well over 1 million Jews have come home from Russia. You know why? Israel matters. 1991, Operation Solomon, 4,000 Ethiopian Jews were airlifted from Addis Ababa. I've met a bunch of them. There's a real interesting story, though, I want to share with you with one of the planes that arrived from Israel, to Israel from Ethiopia. The plane actually had a 10-passenger increase. They, num- they counted up the people, and when it landed, they counted 10 more. Nobody understood. Like, where did the increase come from? 10 women went into labor on the plane and gave birth. Now, that's kind of cool, but there's something way cooler than that, and it's called Scripture. Look at Jeremiah 31.8. Look, I am bringing you from the land in the north, gathering you from the far ends of the earth. Among them are the blind, the lame, women with children, women in labor. God is always right. (laughs) Jewish communities have been uncovered in Portugal, the Dominican Republic, Nigeria, Uganda, China, Italy, Libya, and India. In 2006, 7,000 Eastern Indian Jews from the tribe of Manasseh were airlifted to Israel. After 2,700 years of Assyrian exile, wherever you go, God said in Deuteronomy, I will find you. Look at Isaiah 49, 12. There they come, some far away, some from the north and some from the west and some from the land of Sinim. What's Sinim? Sinim is the ancient word for China. Lo and behold, God miraculously uncovers the Jews of Kaifeng. Jews of Kaifeng, and on October 20, 2009, the Kaifeng Jews arrive in Israel. Why care about a few Chinese Jews? Because Israel matters. And let us not forget, if that's not enough to stir you a little bit and just get you scratching your head and going, hmm, maybe I should care about them. What about this crazy phenomenon regarding decisions to divide Israel and natural disasters? I'm sure you've studied this. If you haven't, please do. It's, there's no coincidence. It's insanity to think it's coincidental. Look at Zechariah 12, 2 through 3. It says, I will make Jerusalem a cup that will stagger the surrounding people. Even Judah will be caught up in the siege against Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem. When that day comes, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples, all who try to lift it. Now, it's obviously a metaphor. You can't lift a country, right? Will hurt themselves, and all the earth's nations will be massed against her. So he's talking about at the very end days, all the nations. People ask me this all the time. I'm like, do you think America will go against Israel? Unless she stops being a nation. The Bible, all is all. All is all. Listen, if you think that war is staying over there, you're crazy. If you think it's not coming here, you're crazy. Look at the word lift up so she, you know, amas, not, which comes from hamas, to divide, to parcel, to cut up, or to move. You know anybody that's been trying to divide Israel? You know anybody that tried to not move the embassy? You know, listen, it's very easy for you to play armchair quarterback. You know what I say? Put on a uniform and go over there right now. And you'll know what it's like. Let 40 babies in America, let bombs come from Canada, 5,000 rockets into Detroit, and let 40 babies in Detroit get beheaded. We'll see what Americans say. We'll see if you still do the pro, pro-Canada rallies at colleges. They have it coming to them. Nobody has that coming to them, kid. That's pure personified evil. And it's insane for anybody to think anything less. I'll just give you a couple of examples. I'm not going to, there's so many, it's ridiculous. October 30th, 1991, President George Bush, as president at the time, is opening the Madrid Conference. That Madrid Conference was to have land for peace, urging Israel, give up the land, just give up more, and, and you'll have peace. Look, he was a nice guy, but he didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't understand the spiritual implications. The perfect storm, you heard about it, develops in the North Atlantic. As soon as he makes that decision and pushing Israel, creating the largest waves ever recorded in that region, the storm travels supernaturally. It goes 1,000 miles east to west instead of the usual west to east pattern and crashes into the New England coast. 35-foot waves, the biggest waves, hit where? His home in Kenny Bunkport. You don't think God was sending him a message? August 23rd, 1992, the Madrid Conference continues, and it focuses on land for peace, and now it moves to Washington, D.C. As the peace talks resume, give up land, Hurricane Andrew hits. The worst natural disaster to hit America and produces $32 billion in damage. Just for the record, the Talmud, the Jewish teachings, teach that he who creates exiles in the Holy Land will have a hundredfold exiles in his own land. August 15th to 22, 2005, the Israelis evicted the beautiful area of Gush Katif. I've been there many times. My friend was the colonel of that operation, and he said it was the worst thing. He didn't sleep for two weeks. Because as he's pulling the people out, the people are hitting him and saying, Hitler, Hitler. He ha- he's crying. He has to pull them out because they made the deal. He has no choice. He has to follow orders. So they displaced how many Jews were living in Gush Katif? 8,500. Remember that number, 8,500. 500. The very next day when they finished evicting the Jews out of Gush Katif in Gaza, the very next day, August 23rd, 2005, Hurricane Katrina develops in the Bahamas, hits Louisiana, and how many people are displaced? 850,000. An exact multiple of 100. Why does Israel matter so much? Well, first of all, God loves her. Look at Deuteronomy 7. I don't know it didn't set his heart on you. Don't give yourself so much credit, Israel. See, they got a little prideful with their technology. People tell me, oh, the Iron Dome. Yeah, but you know what happened? They got so prideful, they thought they had eyes on everything. So what the Islamic people did, they said they got eyes on us. They know when we're talking. They know. So we'll use couriers and face-to-face meetings. Do, do you know why they told the people not to leave? Who, who does this? Look, believe it or not, I was in a few fights in my life. Who goes outside of a bar and says to the guy, listen, um, I'm going to take this fist and I'm going to hit you here on the count of three. Ready? Get ready. One. Who does this? Who drops leaflets and says, please leave? Jihad is telling them not to leave in honor of Allah. It's not in honor of Allah. They use those people as shields. If all the people leave, then it's easy. We can figure out who stays. It's going to be Hamas. Really shooting rockets from schools? 
Hospitals? Really? It's despicable, man. And, 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 and the kids on the college campus. You're an idiot. Please. Study. Know what you're talking about at least. You're entitled to your opinion, but it's so wrong without any knowledge. You might have zeal without knowledge. It's okay. Have your opinions. I'm not on social media. Knock yourself out. I have a colonel friend of mine. He said that his family perished in the Holocaust. He said when he went in there and he saw two and three and four-year-old kids mutilated, dismembered, when he saw babies beheaded, when he saw old ladies shot point blank and young girls raped, he said he's never seen anything. He said he'll never be normal again. Never be normal again. God says, I didn't set my heart on you because you were special or you numbered more than any other. It wasn't because you were big or grandiose. On the contrary, you were the smallest of all people. You know how many Jews there are in the world? Maybe 13.8 million. How many people are in the world? Almost 8 billion. That means 99.9% of the world's population is non-Jewish. Who cares about this one-tenth of one percent of people? who are in a land that God carves out 8 million miles. He gives them 7,900 miles, and he manages to give them a little piece of land with no oil. <sighs> Boy, if Moses only banged a right out of Goshen instead of banging a left, I'd be paying 40 cents for gas. <laughs> Rather, it was because Adonai loved you and because you wanted to keep the oath. He's a promise keeper. To your ancestors, I promised Abraham, I promised Isaac, I promised Jacob I was going to put you in this land. I promised I would take care of you. I promised I would protect you. They're the apple of his eye, man. Look at Zechariah 2.8. This is deep. It's twofold. For Adonai Tzavot, the Lord of heaven's armies, to his power, has sent me on a glorious mission to the nations that plundered you. And this is what he says, anyone who injures you, injures the pupil of my eye. Now, I don't know if you've ever been jabbed in the eye, even by accident, it hurts. Now, the pupil is that which gives vision. So Israel was God's vision to save the world. But he's also talking metaphorically as the vision to save the world. But he's also talking, when you poke Israel in the eye, you are poking God in the eye. Make no mistake about that. And I don't care how often you go to church, and I don't care how much you love Jesus. You're still doing that. God used the Jewish people 2,000 years ago to bring the Messiah, and he's going to use them in these last days to bring Messiah back. Amen. Israel is God's prophetic timepiece in bringing Messiah back. It all points to her. All eyes are on her. A little stinking nation, and all eyes are on her. You know what's going on in Switzerland? Of course not. But you know what's going on in Israel. She's been front and center. God is setting the stage. He goes, watch what I'm going to do. Didn't Jesus say, you won't see me again until you say? Israel has to say that. And guess what? She will. The nations will surround her, and she will say it. And that will bring him back. It's predicated on that. Israel is God's prophetic timepiece, and that's exactly why the devil hates us so. What you are witnessing today in Israel is the spirit of the Antichrist. And it's been around for a very long time. Ever since the Abraham covenant was announced, the target was on her back. The Antichrist spirit goes way back. Pharaoh had the Antichrist spirit and tried to kill all the Jews. Why? Because Satan knew no Jews, no Jesus. She had to birth him. So if he took out all the Jews, nothing to worry about. Satan stays in business. Then the Antichrist spirit entered Ashaviris, and he tried to kill all the Jews. And that's how we have the Purim story. And then Antiochus Epiphanes entered him, entered a lot of others, but these are the biggies. And we have the Hanukkah story. And then he was born. So the Antichrist spirit has to do something. So it enters Herod. Kill all the boys two and under. We don't want them to grow up and die. But God, of course, thwarts the Antichrist spirit's plans. 
So why this battle cry to kill all the Jews, kill all the Jews, kill all the Jews? No Jews, no Jesus. Anti-Semitism is a well-worn path that leads to destruction of its traveler. Pharaoh, Haman, Antiochus, Hitler, Arafat, Khomeini, and Hussein all paid a price for cursing Israel and the Jewish people. Today, the Antichrist spirit runs deep with Hamas, the Taliban, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the entire Islamic Republic of Iran. In the last days, the nations of the world will be the enemies of God, and Jerusalem will be the focus of worldwide contention. Our deliverer won't be Moses, our deliverer won't be Mordecai, and our deliverer won't be the Maccabees. Our deliverer will be none other than Mashiach himself. <laughs> Jesus is not coming back to an Islamic nation called Palestine, but to a restored nation of Israel as her king. The name of Israel was never called Palestine. As I told you, the children of Israel were in the land since the 14th century B.C. The Philistines, which were a people, didn't come to Israel until 1185 B.C. And they occupied five cities, Ashdod, Ashkelon, still there, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza. The modern-day Palestinian people cannot trace their lineage to these people. It's impossible. The best of DNA can't because the Philistines were from the Aegean or Greece. The name Palestine is simply a political fabrication, make no mistake. There was no such place, and there are no such people. As the kids would say, facts. The fact is that the Jewish people and the Arab people are relatives. They have the same Y chromosomes, but no such thing as Palestinians. It's a horrible thing with what's going on, and sadly enough, it's only just begun. You as a believer, hear me, if you hear nothing else, just hear this. You as a believer must be careful not to fall prey to deception. It is coming on like gangbusters. Those of us who love Jesus must not fail to love the people he loves and is coming back to fight for and save, namely the Jewish people. You must maintain a biblical worldview on all things. The war has nothing to do with geopolitics and it has nothing to do with the land. It's all about the Lord and his glory. The war is an end time battle between God and Satan and between the Messiah and the anti-Messiah. Stop messing around with politics and ideologies and get on God's side of this thing for heaven's sake. Isaiah 14 says the Lord established Zion. Psalm 9 says the Lord lives in Zion. Psalm 78 says the Lord loves Zion. And Zechariah 8 says God is jealous over Zion. Sounds to me like God's a Zionist. (laughs) And the ultimate Zionist is preparing to send Yeshua back as the king of a restored nation of Israel. And the line of Judah is preparing to roar like never before. In the meantime, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and my friends, I will say peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. Let's stand together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. The assembly shalom. I love you. Shabbat shalom.